All right, this is class number 14 of Lutheranism during the Third Reich, and uh, we are continuing with the very controversial track that we started with last week called On the Jews and Their Lies. And so uh, we, we got mostly into an introduction on this last time. Uh, this time we're actually going to get into the meat of Luther's arguments and talk about what he is, is getting at. Remember, this is 78 single-spaced pages um, people mostly just read the last page and make, get the pull quotes off of there. And that's what, you know, got circulated in Germany at the time. And, and we will get to those eventually, but not today. Um, but I, I want to go more into what he actually says so that you have a, a better understanding, a broader understanding of what's actually in this document. So the question then that you, you know, you want to ask is what were the lies? Okay. What, what is Luther writing about? Um, and one of the first things that he gets to in the document is that there was this misplaced belief in circumcision's uniqueness to Israel. All right. So uh, the Jewish people claimed that circumcision was theirs alone, but Luther points out that others were also circumcised, and this is mentioned in the scriptures, uh, including Ishmael and the Edomites, who were descended from Isaac. Um, in the tract, Luther condemns them for, for the Jewish people for believing that they are God's people merely by reason of circumcision. All right. So why don't we just get to this here? Uh, Genesis 17, verse 12. Let's look that up. Genesis 17, 12. Anyone there? It's the first book, Donna. You look like you're there. You looked at me, so. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from the foreigners, those who are not your offspring. Those who are not your offspring. Okay, so we, we have this outside of Israel thing now being circumcised. And, and, and at least by Luther's time, there was this uh, argument that apparently the, the, the Jewish people were making, that they were, um, you know, that circumcision was unique to them, that it was something uniquely given to them, and it was a unique way that they were brought into the covenant, right? Um, and, and Luther says here, uh, therefore, it is not a clever and ingenious, but a clumsy, foolish, and stupid lie, what's that word again, uh, when the Jews boast of their circumcision before God, presuming that God should regard them graciously for that reason. Though they should certainly know from Scripture that they are not the only race circumcised in compliance with God's decree, and that they cannot on that account be God's special people. So, you know, he, he is making this argument, um, as, as we've said before, to Christians who may be exposed in his time to Judaism, uh, because th th there was that possibility in Europe, <clears throat> right? So he, he continues on. He stays on circumcision for a bit in this document. Circumcision would save a part from faith. Uh, and so they brazenly strut before God, lie and boast about being God's only people by reason of their physical circumcision, unmindful of the circumcision of the heart. And, you know, this is um, actually something that is is brought up to them in the book of Acts uh in the speech by Stephen when when he talks to them about being stiff-necked uh and obstinate and being just like their fathers and always rejecting the holy spirit right and uh then he writes they always divorce circumcision as an opus operatum what did we say that was maybe we should ask our seminarian <laughs> we get a 13 minute answer An opus operatum. It's Latin. Yeah, the the uh, the work having been worked. So it, it just do the work, and that's sufficient. Nothing else is needed. You don't need to have faith or anything. Just just you know. Be circumcised and then go live as a pagan and and you're good. Um, so 
uh, and they persecuted all the prophets through whom God wished to speak with them according to the terms in which circumcision was instituted. So, you know, circumcision made them a part of the uh, Abrahamic covenant, right? And, uh, you know, there was, there was a couple different uh, dimensions to that. But, you know, they were also called to be the people of God, and being the people of God came with, you know, an expression of that identity. But, no, nope, we got circumcised, we're good. Uh, it, it would just be like us saying, well, I'm baptized, so now I can go do whatever I want, which is actually kind of a thing that, that I come across, uh, no offense to anybody out there who's watching this who, who is of this church, but there's a particular church that I will not name that as long as you go to confession, it seems like you can do whatever you want. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, now, now here is a really interesting thing that he says about baptism and the Lord's Supper. In this document, uh, the following is an analogous situation for us Christians. God gave us baptism, the sacrament of his body and blood, and the keys for the ultimate purpose or final cause that we should hear his word in them and exercise our faith therein. That is, he intends to be our God through them, and through them we are to be his people. However, what did we do? We proceeded to separate the word and faith from the sacrament, that is, from God and his ultimate purpose and converted it into a mere opus legis, a work of the law, or as the papists call it, an opus operatum, merely a human work which the priest offered to God and the laity performed as a work of obedience as often as they received it. What is left of the sacrament? Only the empty husk, the mere ceremony, opus vanum, divested of everything divine, Yes, it is a hideous abomination in which we perverted God's truth into lies and worshipped the veritable calf of Aaron. Therefore, God also delivered us into all sorts of terrible blindness and innumerable false doctrines. And furthermore, he permitted Muhammad and the Pope together with all the devils to come upon us. Well, that's just going after all his enemies in one sense. <laughs> so any, any thoughts about this? Do you guys understand what he's saying here? You know, now he is going back to what he felt the church of his time had done with these things that he then since reformed, right? But uh, uh, an opus vanum, right? A, a work of vanity, um, a work of, you know, nothingness. It's just it, just it, it's appearances, right? And and then so it's just go to the supper, have baptism, but you don't need to have faith because you've you've checked the box. And, and so um, you know we know that uh, you know the means of grace create faith. Right. And they bring us into a relationship with Christ or in the case of the Lord's Supper, they forgive sins. It forgives sins. Um, it reinforces our relationship with Jesus. It proclaims us to be members of the new covenant. Uh, but the mindset of the time was to, to merely look at those things the same way that the Jewish people had come to look at circumcision, which was just to, to look at the outside of it, not to look at what God was doing through it. And um, this is often the argument that is still waged against us today when we talk about salvation by baptism, when we talk about the forgiveness of sins coming through the sacrament, that people will accuse us of believing this. And Luther condemns this, right? Tanner. So when he's saying it's, uh, if you're like an opus operatum, mm -hmm. It's that then divested of everything divine, and he's talking about the sacraments, the Eucharist and baptism. Surely the body and blood is still there, so it's not divested of everything, right? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously it, it's still what God has, um, you know, designed for it to be, because we know that if you even if you give it to an unbeliever, it's still 
the same. It's still the body and blood of Christ. Um, but he's saying that um, kind of like what I'm going to be talking about in the sermon today, what they had done with the temple, um, that even though it was the place of sacrifice, it was the presence of God, and their thinking differently didn't nullify that, but yet still Jesus calls it a marketplace and a den of robbers. So it's 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 still the same thing. It, it, it's not changing, you know, I don't want to get into this scholastic thought of substance and accidents, but it, it, it doesn't change the substance of what it is, but it changes into how it is perceived and understood. And that they they, they came to see it apart from faith certainly the word right then you're eating and drinking yeah you're eating and drinking but i mean you can um even after you're baptized you can still reject your baptism later in life you can walk away from it you can deny it you know you can always walk away from um the gift that you've been given it doesn't change the status of it being a gift but you can yeah so but it's it's really kind of interesting that he, um, you know, he brings this into his discussion here while he is talking about um, circumcision. Um, but it's it's for for things like this that you know the arguments that people bring up. Well, Luther wrote this toward the end of his life. He was old. He was senile. He didn't know what he was doing. This is this theology is too good to be senile. You know, um, it's too accurate. So. Um, you know, really, we, we can't just dismiss it for reasons of, of age. Um, because even though there are things in here that I talked about are offensive and, you know, we should condemn, um, there's stuff in here that, you know, we would agree with, and that is good theology, right? Because remember, it's, it's like almost 80 pages. So, um, all right. What more, more were lies? Um, they are his special people because God spoke to them, or Moses on Mount Sinai, and gave them his law. For this they have reason to boast. And Luther writes, it is the same kind of boasting when the Jews boast in their synagogues, praising and thanking God for sanctifying them through his law and setting them apart as a peculiar people, although they know full well that they are not at all observing this law, that they are full of conceit, envy, usury, greed, and all sorts of of malice so it's again it's 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 looking uh at the faith merely through externals uh you know they always thought they were safe because they had the promised land they had the temple they had these things and they they looked at them just externally uh apart from apart from you know the um the, the the gifts that would come through these things, right? Um, despite the, the 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 fact that they were his people through the covenant, but but they came to look at the covenant like it was just a, a good luck charm. As long as I have this charm, you know, I'm good. Uh, and he uses this word a lot, external. For the external laws were not given to make a nation the people of God, but to adorn and enhance God's people externally, right? So, uh, you know, maybe in a way you, you think of like Matthew 5, when Jesus says, um, you know, let people see your good works so that they give glory to God, kind of a thing. That the, that the Jewish people... Uh, were called to be separate from the pagan nations and that they would be distinct, that they would be different so that when other people would see them, they would recognize them as God's people uh, as opposed to like all the pagan nations who, nations who were doing all these things that were, uh, you know, contrary to God's law. Okay. Now, this is some really interesting evidence that I didn't know existed until this morning. Um, but uh, Luther actually has a debate with some Jewish people in Wittenberg. He says, I once experienced this myself. Three learned Jews came to me hoping to discover a new Jew in me because we were beginning to read Hebrew here in Wittenberg. And remarking that matters would soon improve since we Christians were starting to read their books. 
When I debated with them, they gave me their glosses as they usually do. But when I forced them back to the text, they soon fled from it, saying that they were obliged to believe their rabbis as we do the Pope and the doctors, etc. I took pity on them and gave them a letter of recommendation to the authorities asking that for Christ's sake, they let them freely go their way. But later I found out that they called Christ a tola, that is a hanged highwayman. Therefore, I do not wish to have anything more to do with any Jew. As St. Paul says, they are consigned to wrath. The more one tries to help them, the baser and more stubborn they become, leave them to their own devices. So as the Reformation now was, was happening, remember that we talked about sort of the growing snowball of anti-Semitism in Europe through the centuries. And um, it, it was so that by this time, uh, you know, if, if you were Jewish, you, you may have needed to have gotten permission to go into a certain city or country. It's not like here where you can just go where you want, but, but you needed to have permission. And so Luther, that's what Luther is. He's giving them this letter of recommendation here, you know, that they can leave freely and not, not be harassed. But, you know, he, he, he debates with them because um, it, it may have been the thought that the Jewish people uh, of that time were now impressed that the Christians were reading Jewish books again. Uh, because now the Bible is interpreted, uh, it's being disseminated, other people have access to it. And so um, people were getting back into the Hebrew scriptures. And... Uh, Maybe the Jewish people thought, well, by reading the Jewish scriptures, that Christians might either come to have a deeper appreciation of them or maybe deconvert somehow or something like that. And so Luther gets into this debate from them, but they go back to the teachings of their rabbis and they, you know, reject uh, what Luther has to say. And I think this is part of, you know, his reason for writing the tract because he feels like he's making these efforts to be reasonable, to convert, to have dialogue, right? And, and so he does actually, it's not just like he hears things about them, but now he's actually talking to them firsthand, right? And so he has this, this level of interaction with them. Um, but then somehow later on, he finds out that they reject what he says and they um, you know, say what would be perceived as an insult for, for us as Christians. And, and so then he, he sort of returns it and then just says, well, never mind. Right. Now, in this tract, he also goes out of his way to talk about, he, he may, he's making arguments for how Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. So it's almost like he's he's writing to the Jewish people themselves, right? That he wants them to read this. And, and these are three of the arguments that, that he raises in the tract, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah um, because he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. The first one that he raises is from Genesis 49, verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Okay, so let's actually, let's turn there. Genesis 49, verse 10. And who is there? Aaron? Okay tribute shiloh this is kind of a tricky interpretation luther goes into some some detail about that uh but but he you know luther's conclusion is that um shiloh comes or tribute comes and that's jesus and so now uh, the scepter then is carried on through jesus which of course jesus is of the tribe of judah so you know that um that makes sense Right. Um, so, um, yeah. And uh, he, he spends several pages uh, on this. 
and um, uh, you know, he, he uses this as part of his argument. He goes into Hebrew. He looks at the original Hebrew of the word for scepter. He talks about the importance of the scepter, right? Then um, one of the next thing he goes into, David will have an heir on the throne of Israel forever. All right, 2 Samuel 7, 12. Let's look at this. Ethan, it looks like you're pecking away there. All right, go for it. When your days are fulfilled, lie down with your fathers. I will raise up you your offspring after you. You shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. All right, your offspring from your body, and I will establish his, his kingdom. Okay, so um, there's some other verses that, that talk about that this offspring will be on the throne of David forever. And, and Luther raises the argument, well, how... How can you say that you have an offspring on the throne of David when your country hasn't existed for 1,500 years by, by Luther's time? Right? Because if the Romans come and destroy it, and now you don't, uh, of course, the Romans put their own person in the place of the high priest, and the Israelites didn't have a king during that time. But, um, you know, at the end of the nation would come the end of their thought of what the kingship is. But with us as Christians, you know, Jesus sits on the throne of David forever because he is a descendant of David. He is the offspring that the passage is talking about. So by that token, Luther is, uh, is saying that, you know, hey, um, this is what um, this is what's what's happening. And then um, one verse before, Ethan, if you can scroll up, the Lord will build a house for you or for us. From the time that I appointed judges over my people to this day, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. All right, the Lord will make you a house. I mean, and and so there was this debate that David wanted to build a house for God, right, a temple, and God said, "No, your son will build it." Right, the son will build the house, and so. Uh, you know, but, but Luther also is going into the theology of this, that this is more than just a building of stone, but that this house is the legacy of kingship uh, of David that extends through Christ as, uh, as the king of God's people. So then you get into the understanding of Jesus as the new Israel, God's people as the new Israel, the church as the new Israel. Right. And, and so now we're, we're moving away from, you know, what's what's commonly thought uh, in a lot of circles today that, well, Israel is going to become, you know, God's people again. They'll rebuild the temple. I talk about this. I always say my sermon in here, um, you know, that they'll rebuild the temple, that, that God will show them favor and, and all of this. And uh, Luther is making the argument that, well, no, Christ is the house that is being built. He is the legacy uh, for us um, as the, the people of God. So he's really, um, he's, he, I think he's writing to two different audiences. It, you know, in the event that the Jews, Jewish people come across this document, he's making the argument to them. He's also making it to Christians who he wants to um, give them a more solid understanding so that they will interpret these verses correctly as opposed to other interpretations they might get from Jewish people who would have a different understanding of, of what these verses mean. So this is what he is, you know, the tract has a number of different points that it is, is seeking to make. Um, but largely is, it is about, um, you know, it's, it's an apologetic work that's designed to keep Christians Christian and to argue against um, Jewish claims of salvation, right? In, in much the same way that the Book of Concord was written by Lutherans um, in the Augsburg Confession and given to the Catholic Church and saying, here's where we agree with you, but here's where we disagree with you. And it's, it's you know, um, along, those, along those same lines that he's making that, uh, that argument. You know, because Luther used to love to write, and, and he was always 
writing um, oftentimes against someone, against some other teacher or teaching of his time, whether it was Catholicism or the Pope or the Anabaptist or the Jewish people. He was he was always writing and using his language uh, to not be so uh, so subtle in his disagreement. But I don't know. I kind of think that's how all the Germans used to talk back then. So um, this is where I'm going to wind up today. Any thoughts about any of this? Bon uh, Donna. Well, we haven't gone to the conclusions yet. Hitler didn't care about any of this stuff. This is all just theology. He doesn't waste his time with this. Um, he's going to get the poll quotes from the end. And then the poll quotes from, from the end of the book, you'll see, um, maybe if I can clear 40 more pages of this by next week, we'll, we'll finish and jump to the end. Uh, we'll see. But, um, you know, Luther has some recommendations about the end about driving the Jewish people out doing things to their synagogues, to their books. And, and that's what, what Hitler comes along and says, oh, look. And then also some of the language that we talked about so far about calling the Jewish people devils and liars, which we know that he uses towards lots of different people. And he, we talked last week how he particularly likes the word devils, right? Though devils all the world should fill, it's, it's in a mighty fortress, right? Um, and, and that we also talked about how, um, you know, for many centuries and including up through Luther's time that you thought in terms of enemies, uh, and that you went after your enemies, you know, today we don't do that anymore because it's considered unchristian, right? It's not nice, right? But, but back then, I mean, and I'm sure that. You know, the Jewish people went on after the Christians, too, after a while. They probably thought, oh, we thought the Reformation was going to do this and that, but it's just kind of the same old stuff that, you know, has been said about us. And so there's nothing new there under the sun, on and on. Um, so they, they probably had similar thoughts that they expressed as well. That, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Any other thoughts? None? All right. Well, maybe we'll wrap up a little bit early today and then we'll pick back up next week but let's uh let's close in prayer heavenly father we, we thank you lord for the teachings of the scriptures that promise us uh, eternal life through your son jesus christ and we pray that as we look back into history we would continue to um uncover uh more things that that we would um have a right understanding about you and that we can share that understanding with the people of our day and also reflect on what um, the people of the past may have gotten wrong. And so we pray that you would be with us as we witness to you, um, as your son Jesus is the only um, salvation. In his name we pray. Amen.